So thank you for attending uh, the webinar today. Uh, my name is uh, Giulio Zuanetti and uh, I'm a board member of Reviewer Credits, a company that is very much involved uh, in the peer review space. And we are kind of hosting a series of webinars centered on uh, several issues uh, of peer review. It is my real pleasure today to introduce Professor Anna Marusic. Uh, who will try to answer the question on how integrity in peer review can help academic publishing. To list all the, accompl all, all the accomplishment of Professor Marusic would uh, really take all the time of the webinar. She's a professor of anatomy and chair of the Department of Research in Biomedicine and Health at the University of Split in Croatia. She's also an honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh in UK and a co-editor-in-chief of the uh, Journal of Global Health. More importantly, she has been and is in the steering group of the Quinter Network and co-chair of the Cochrane uh, Scientific Committee and also serves on the co-publication ethics. So it's very much a pleasure for me to leave the floor or the screen uh, to Professor Marusic. I just wanted to remind you that you can ask a question uh, by uh, typing your question in the chat area, which is on the right of your screen. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Giulio. It's my real pleasure to be here with you. And I thank uh, Giulio, Giacomo and Valeria from uh, Reviewer Credits uh, for the invitation and opportunity to uh, talk to you. Uh, and um, I could actually end up my presentation already now because, you know, to say you know, how we can improve um, uh, peer review, integrity of the peer review, I can say we don't know. <laughs> because as far as uh, the evidence goes, we are very good at uh, discovering what is wrong with peer review uh, and what problems there are, uh, but we don't have so much evidence of, of what really works. I have been uh, doing research in peer review for many years and I have attended almost all, but not maybe the first two peer review congresses in biomedicine that are famous uh, and uh, are... Uh, um, held every every three years or more than every three years. And the evidence that we have so far is that we don't know that much about peer review um, that we had then uh, many, many years ago. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you will be more of a kind of a collective wisdom and evidence that we have uh, in the years that we work uh, with the peer review editors. And I'm especially would like to thank my colleagues from the PIRI your credits uh, by Professor uh, Flaminio Squazzoni, um, who also talked about uh, peer review. So a lot of work and he talked about uh, the evidence that we have uh, on big data um, and we had a training uh, school on a peer review together with colleagues late John Tennant and Sabina Alam and what I'm going to talk about is what we actually discussed then and uh, um, how to go about uh, peer review. So I'm going to share my uh, screen now and uh, start with the presentation. Just bear with me a little bit. Okay, so as I said, this is a quite a difficult question and a question that doesn't have an answer. So what I'm going to talk about is, is more about uh, the innovations and initiatives that we have today in peer review, which are actually addressing the integrity of the peer review. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what um, integrity is in peer review, how we can uh, do peer review responsibly. So uh, let's start. Um, and when we talk about peer review, I come from uh, the medical field and probably we have different uh, views, attitudes about uh, peer review than maybe in some other fields. Uh, but generally, uh, we see it as some kind of a black box. And this is one of one of the um, famous illustrations in JAMA uh, that uh, was uh, published together with the reports uh, from the peer review congresses, where you see that as a researcher, and I'm here talking 
primarily from a perspective of a researcher. When you send a manuscript to the journal, it goes into a black box and then something happens in there and most of the papers get rejected and some get published. Although we know, and this is one of the things that the innovations in peer review brought about, is that now we know much more of what happens in there. We know that it's a complicated system, that uh, there are several rounds of um, peer review processes, many stakeholders involved, and then the final decision can uh, be different and uh, hopefully for a researcher an acceptance. Uh, to know about what we have today in peer review and how we are addressing the question of integrity of peer review, it's really very uh, good to know your enemies or the history of peer review. And you all know that uh, uh, five years ago we celebrated 350 years of uh, uh, scientific journals and the first scientific journals were published in 1665 in France and, and in the UK and you see it here on this timeline in a really great uh, paper published by late John Tennant and, and colleagues about uh, the, the history and, and the development of peer review. But you see here that uh, peer review didn't start with the journals, that it was introduced almost a century later uh, by the Royal Society of Edinburgh when um, the society members uh, actually reviewed uh, the submissions uh, to, to their journal. And when you look at um, the kind of modern times of peer review, you see that Nature introduced peer review only in uh, the 1950s, which, which is really uh, quite uh, late uh, for peer review. And many journals like the BMJ didn't have external peer review and some journals uh, don't have external peer review even today, but it is done by large editorial boards and so on and so on. So it's not surprising that the in the beginning, the, the even in the, in, the, in the modern times, the attitudes of uh, researchers towards peer review were not really that positive. Uh, I'm trying to move my presentation. Oh, you saw, so you see here, uh, a, a letter of an author to a journal uh, that says that uh, the authors, Mr. Rosen and I, we send our manuscript for publication and had not authorized uh, the editor sh to show it to specialists before it's printed. And they see no reason why uh, they should answer anyway erroneous comments of uh, anonymous experts and they retract their paper and prefer to publish Um, um, unless you know that uh, the person who signed it, and it was Albert Einstein in 1936, in one of uh, uh, his uh, work. And then uh, in the 20th centuries, from the 1990s, you have the expansion of all kinds of different initiative innovations that were either uh, directly about peer review or about other ways of uh, sharing, evaluating, commenting and using uh, scientific uh, data. So you he see here that the first preprint archive was launched in 1990, archive. Then we have these mega journals, uh, uh, Biomed Central uh, uh, opening peer review and publishing review and names. We have actually kind of failures of public peer review in nature and in some medical journals even before that uh, um, there are public comments uh, then we have eLife uh, launching a special type of peer review which is collaborative peer review then we have open or post-publication peer review with F1000 uh, research and other uh, kinds of uh, initiatives which you, which you see here that we have um, online journal clubs uh, for commenting after publishing we have co-working hubs for researchers like paper have uh, Hive, uh, Publoms uh, for tracking peer review activities, rubric, which is a kind of consultancy in peer review, taking peer review out of journals and then bringing it back. Peerage of Science, Winover, PubPub, RIO, Science Open as different platforms for researchers to publish, comment, exchange uh, different uh, parts uh, of uh, uh, their research, including results. So what we have now is really 
a great market in peer review when we can choose different types of peer review. And in my view, these different types of peer review were developed in uh, actually, and one of the reasons was that they address the integrity of um, uh, peer review and trying to reduce the bias and introduce uh, more control. It's, it's peer review is something, uh, you know, they, they say it's like democracy. It's, we know that it doesn't, that it has many fallacies and it doesn't work, but it's, the, the best thing that we have. And this is the same uh, um, here in, in uh, uh, choosing the approaches, how to do uh, peer review uh, responsibly. Um, we have to innovate and we know that it some, sometimes cannot uh, work. I recall really well a colleague, um, Mike Callahan from the Emergency Medicine Journal who presented at uh, several uh, peer review uh, conferences, congresses, uh, his uh, efforts to teach peer review. So he did uh, um, randomized control trials, mentoring, uh, cohort studies with different interventions to teach peer review to show that it's really each uh, peer review effectively if you test it in, in a, a very rigorous way. So this is quite elusive and uh, that's why we have so many different approaches to peer review today. So I'm going to talk about uh, the types of peer review, uh, mostly because, as I said, they address the different types of biases that we can have and also uh, they uh, improve in a way uh, by addressing these biases, the integrity of peer review. So we have single blind, double blind, triple blind and uh, the single and double blind are probably the most common, but, but there are other, these new types of uh, peer review, like transferable peer review, consultative, results-free, open peer review, which is quite common now in medicine, or post-publication uh, peer review. Uh, um, as a single blind peer review, uh, I, as I said, I come from biomedical field and this is uh, a standard now, although especially in, in medicine we are moving to open peer review. And this is where the authors don't know the identity and the reviewers know the identity of authors. Uh, some people say that this is not uh, blinded enough, that we need uh, more rigor in this. But th there is research actually that shows that uh, although authors um, know, think they know who the reviewers are and are usually very angry uh, with them, uh, it's really not uh, that often that they can really guess uh, who the reviewers are. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very difficult to blind a manuscript uh, to the author's identity and uh, very often uh, the reviewers know the, can guess the identity of, of authors quite uh, successfully. So, although this is in, in some disciplines, it's, it's a, a standard of peer review, we know that it has problems, but again, this is some, and, and we think that there are problems even when uh, the problems are not there, like in uh, uh, authors not knowing the identity of uh, the reviewers. Uh, double blind, uh, those of, of you who come from the social science and humanities, this is a standard where neither the author nor the reviewer know the identity uh, um, of each other. And uh, what is known from evidence that we have is that uh, when you ask different researchers across discipline, they say that they like it and that this is a preferred peer review system. And there are some journals that uh, traditionally use single blind uh, peer review, even in biomedicine, that are offering authors to opt in to double blind peer review, like Nature, Nature Communications, and so on and so on. Uh, the first results, I don't know how, how this uh, experiment is developing, but I know that the first results uh, um, were that not many authors actually opted in, and those people that um, wanted a double-blind peer review were researchers from smaller scientific communities and the uh, well-known uh, researchers from uh, large uh, research centers didn't want to to uh, opt in for double blind peer review so when you're big and and strong you want them uh, you want the reviewers to know who you are and if you're, you're coming from a smaller scientific community you hope that this blinding can increase uh, geographical bias that we also know exists in in peer review so this is about uh, double review and it's still a, a very strong standard actually in uh, uh, disciplines in, in uh, social sciences and humanities.
And some journals now, uh, they say, okay, we have author and reviewer, we can blind them, but we cannot blind the editors. Editors is the person, like in randomized controlled trial, someone who has to know everything about it. Uh, and we as ed journal editors make decisions on uh, uh, manuscripts for which we know who the authors and, and reviewers are, and we can be influenced uh, unconsciously, and that's also um, a bias. So some journals, like the one I'm showing uh, here, it's uh, a new journal, and there are several journals, especially from hard sciences, um, that have a system where even the uh, the editor is blinded when the decision is uh, uh, being made. So everything is coded. There is a separate person that uh, uh, knows the identity and handles uh, uh, these issues, but the uh, deciding author doesn't know the identity, deciding editor doesn't know the identity of the authors or the uh, reviewers. And in this way, uh, there is definitely a, a decrease in uh, uh, and, and that happens in some society journals where, or bigger journals where Editors are, again, randomly assigned. They are also blinded to uh, the manuscript. So it, lo it, it is, in a way, like a uh, randomized controlled trial where you try to address these biases, many of the biases, by blinding all of the people that are involved in collecting, um, analyzing, and interpreting uh, data. So these are uh, initiatives, and, and we'll see uh, what happens and, and where we go uh, with this. So many journals, and, and this is a part of the integrity of the peer review, both from the side of the journals and the authors. So journals shouldn't submit their work to different journals and then decide where they're going to publish because it wastes time of um, perhaps uh, same reviewers for different uh, journals. So many journals that had the large uh, publishing uh, um, houses uh, were from the first journal where the journal decided that the manuscript is not suitable for publication they can transfer it to another journal of course this is something that uh, so uh, uh, the uh, author has to choose uh, at the submission stage whether uh, the authors agree uh, to transfer this uh, journal after rejection. And this is something that actually speeds the time of publishing because uh, the, the, the article is not reviewed once again by different reviewers, but good uh, reviews and good reviewer comments are used and the speed of uh, uh, publishing is uh, increased. And again, this also elevates the integrity of the published record and actually prevents uh, research waste in, in many uh, ways. And then uh, eLife and Frontiers journals, I think that eLife was uh, one of the first to develop it, is uh, where you actually have a panel of reviewers. In a standard situation in a journal, um, the reviewers are um, sent in their uh, reviews. Uh, they are not aware of each other. They may learn about what the other reviewers say after editorial decision, when the, the decision and the reviewer comments are sent both to the authors and uh, to uh, the all reviewers. But in eLife, actually, reviewers come together to a panel. They discuss what each of them said, and then there is a, a final communication that is kind of a joint uh, communication uh, and a unified decision that is sent to the authors and uh, decision is made. So this is what consultative peer review is, and it kind of is like a panel meetings for a grant uh, review and um, uh, that can uh, harmonize and, and that can uh, actually help editors when you have conflicting reviews that uh, the reviewers resolve these conflicts before um, uh, they are sent to uh, the authors, decide on what is important, what is not, and not leaving it uh, to the editor to deal with it together with the author. And then we have something that is quite old as, as uh, a concept and has been tested experimentally a long time ago, and this is a results-free peer review or pre-registration. It's very common in psychology journals. I know of example of BMC psychology because it comes from biomedicine where authors can opt in that uh, the 
peer, re uh, peer review is done first on um, the uh, plan, on uh, the uh, protocol or study design of uh, uh, the study. So this is submitted before actual research is started. The, the results uh, or discussion are not uh, reviewed and then when uh, the stage one is passed when the reviewers say oh this is interesting and so on then in stage two reviewers are to ask if the results match the aims and, and the hypothesis from the beginning the research question and whether the methodology was uh, uh, followed and whether the results are in uh, relates uh, well to to the methodology and this is actually something that uh, tries to address the confirmatory bias that we know that exists in uh, um, peer review and that is that the reviewers uh, give higher um, recommendations and higher opinion on uh, research that follows the current dogma. And th this was a set of uh, really elegant experiments by Mahone in 1974, uh, who sent uh, fake uh, papers to review, fake uh, altered uh, papers to reviewers, where in one, the methodology and in, in the research question are the same, but the results are pre presented in a way that they follow the current dogma in uh, or current agreement in, in research, and the other one goes against the current uh, uh, dogma in research to show that the reviewers uh, definitely show this confirmatory bias and, and uh, uh, preferred the results that confirmed what they all thought at, at that time. So his suggestion was that the reviewers shouldn't see the results. They should see the, uh, the research question, whether it's a good research question. They should see the methodology, so whether the methodological approach to the question was good. And then uh, the question of presenting data uh, is more of a technical matter and editorial issue than uh, actually assessment of peer review. Um, I don't think that uh, that is fully true. I think that reviewers should see the results, and especially the discussion, which puts the results in the context of existing research and in future perspectives. But definitely, this is something that has been now uh, elaborated in the current initiatives for pre-registration and two levels of peer review, one on the research idea and the methodological approach, and the second one of the actual results, where if you past stage one, the publication is almost uh, guaranteed. And then we have open peer review, uh, where um, uh, everybody knows uh, who everybody else is, so the identities are known. And uh, there are some variation in some specialty medical journals where the reviewers can opt in. So the reviewer, the review is single blind, but uh, the uh, reviewers can sign their name if they want. And one of the ideas behind open peer review is uh, here in this statement from um, Jeffrey Flyer uh, from one of uh, the papers on a peer review that uh, whenever you have something that is uh, so secret, uh, and uh, there are incent uh, little incentives to performing high quality review, which allows then bias, carelessness, conflict of interest, and other aspects of peer review uh, or, or, or uh, bad aspects of peer review to dominate and to generate inadequate uh, reviews. But uh, the so um, the, the the identities can be known, but they are not made to the public. They are not made fully public for for the whole community to see. They are uh, known, but then the review report is published. So the reviews are published with the paper, but without the names, uh, or that the names are published, but not the report. Or um, they everything is available and everything is made available to the public, where the uh, like in BMC, where you have the original submission, comments of uh, the reviewers, responses of the authors, and then uh, the rounds of peer review until the final version of the article that is uh, published. So this is something that uh, you see that there are different grad gradations in uh, the types of open peer review. And finally, as one of the new developments is post-publication peer review, we all do it when we have journal clubs and when we critically assess uh, published papers. And uh, some of uh, the databases included uh, PubMed used to have these comments where people could comment on published on uh, index papers. There, there are lots of talk about uh, 
uh, papers on social media, but then some of the journals have formalized this process so that, that the paper is first published and then the peer review is then done on uh, this published uh, paper uh, visible to the public, uh, that uh, the, the uh, comments of the peer reviewers are also made public, that the rounds of peer review um, are also made public, and then uh, articles are considered published when two out of three reviewers give uh, positive uh, comments. And here is how it looks, where we have really a public record of every step in that black box of peer review and editorial uh, decision. So here, actually, uh, the reviewers are the main essence of uh, the journal and editors are there to handle this uh, process, which again is different in some journals. For example, we in medicine, and that may be, may be different from um, journals in social science and humanities, editors are the uh, stakeholder or individual that makes a decision. So reviewers there are to help the editors make a decision, but the decision and the responsibility is for the editor, not for the reviewer. And now that we have seen all the different types of uh, peer review that we have. So how can we do it responsibly? And I will just go through some of uh, the standards that we have, and I'm going to talk mostly from the position of a journal editor, uh, but there are also research performing organizations that may address this, the research funding organizations, other organizations. Uh, and I'm going to show, for example, the um, the principles uh, in research integrity that are related to peer review from the European Code of Conduct on Research Integrity. And we know that uh, ethics is important in peer review, that peer review does raise, just like research, many ethical issues and problems, and that these ethical issues can be sometimes very complex and serious. And as in everything about research integrity, there is no black and white, but mostly shades of grey, where each in, uh, individual case has to be looked at and, and decision made uh, individually for the case. And I'm just going to, to state uh, here uh, uh, and, and make a point here that the European Code of Con Conduct for Research Integrity, which is in the foundations, like, like a soft law for the uh, research framework in Europe for the Horizon 2020, whenever we sign a grant agreement, we sign that we're going to abide uh, the uh, Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, uh, which was made by, by the ALIA, uh, all European academies. Uh, and one uh, aspect of this code relates to reviewing, evaluating and editing. And they uh, again say that we have to take seriously this commit commitment, that this process has to be transparent and justifiable, that we have to take care of conflict of interest, that this process is confidential, and that we have to respect the rights. And that even uh, in um, evaluating uh, work of uh, researchers, uh, this can be uh, considered as research misconduct. So if we don't do peer review, adequately and with integrity that can be considered research misconduct. So I just want to give an example, which, which is not misconduct, which I think is more of a sloppiness, but uh, um, uh, results get published where you ask yourself, did anybody look at this? Did anybody read this? How could this pass a peer review? And, and this is an example that uh, um, was given at one of the peer review conferences by David Waugh, uh, who's, who is a, a cancer researcher, but his hobby is to um, catch uh, statistical errors in big journals. And this is an example from The Cell, one of the great journals for publishing you know, new genes and, and very high level molecular biology uh, research, where you he have this uh, study. And then when you look at the end of uh, these uh, legends, they say that the bars in, in these figures that they represent average plus minus means of experiments. And average and mean is the same. So actually there should be zero because average is the mean and they say instead of average plus minus standard deviation or standard error of the mean, they use the two terms that are interchangeable and are the same. So this is such a kind of a basic error that I would flunk my students on on research methodology course, but it got published in the, in the cell. And you can say, okay, maybe the authors uh, don't know much about it, um, but that um, um, uh, they maybe don't know statistics uh, that well. But what about the reviewers? What about the editors? So, you know, when you see these things, then you question yourself, 
does peer review work and, and how uh, much we have to take care of even the little details in, in peer review. And when you look at, uh, the, uh, the, for, the, for example, the biomedical community, these are again the responsibilities uh, in the peer review process from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors and their recommendations for publishing in biomedicine, which again, they emphasize this is a confidential process, that the reviewers have to respond promptly, that we should be aware of the conflicts of interest. And when we look at COPE, which is a committee of uh, publication ethics, they again provide editorial standards and for us uh, to uh, know how to organize peer review, that it does have integrity and the same uh, points and issues are addressed uh, here. Um, and when we decide to review a manuscript, we not only ask ourselves, uh, do we have uh, appropriate expertise? Uh, do I know this field? Uh, maybe there is a conflict of interest if I'm too close uh, to the uh, research uh, um, study, uh, maybe there will be uh, appearance of misconduct, even if I acted ethically. Is there any other apparent or real conflict of interest, like institutional, collaborative or other? And do I have uh, time to review a manuscript, which is also part of uh, the integrity, this responsibility um, of uh, uh, peer reviewers? And then when we agree uh, to um, review a manuscript, we actually enter into a contract. It's not a contract that we sign, but it is a, a contract uh, where we become consultants and we have to apply journals, policies and guidelines for the uh, peer review of uh, manuscripts. And here it is important to know that uh, journals and editors are there to be asked. They are at the service of the uh, authors and the peer reviewers so that they they can make sure that this process is done on time with integrity and with expertise and it's much better to prevent problems than later solve them. And then again, uh, we have to be very much aware of the conflicts, not only of the authors and we see them published, but we don't very often see published uh, conflicts of interest potential or declarations uh, from peer reviewers. And especially we don't have declarations of conflicts of interest of uh, editors and journal staff. And this is another interesting topic that we could talk about, but we don't have time now, maybe in some other webinar. This is something that is my, one of my favorite uh, fields of uh, research. And then um, uh, we very we have to be aware that uh, one thing is to see the abstract, but then again that um, when we see the full paper, maybe we discover that we have some other conflicts of interest because it may provide different information. Uh, we have to know that this is a confidential manuscript that we cannot leave it around or uh, share it on on uh, public drives uh, uh, with other people, and unless there is a permission of the editor to ask someone else to review and uh, state the name of that person. So this uh, um, has to be really confidential. And what is important here, and sometimes very difficult, because we do peer review to know what is happening in in research, and one of the rewards of peer review is not not monetary, but it's that we are there on the surf of uh, the, the frontiers of research and learning new things. And we do want to use it in, in research, but it cannot be done uh, or cited in, in manuscripts before uh, the actual paper that we have reviewed has been published. Uh, and if there, there is um, uh, any question, uh, it's the editor is uh, the messenger in between the reviewer and the author and the reviewer, especially in the situations of open peer review or single blind peer review, shouldn't contact uh, the uh, author directly. You cannot ask help and uh, actually what is important, at least from the editorial uh, point of view, is that uh, you advise the journal about uh, the research and not help the author publish a, a paper. But again, it's uh, also unethical to allow that a badly flawed paper is published and uh, because peer review is a stamp of quality just by like publishing in a journal. And then again, we have to be aware of the biases in journals. Um, we have a bias towards positive results. We have this confirmatory bias uh, against new ideas, against novel methods. And then again, we also have to be aware of whether we should um, provide expertise or editing. Should we edit the paper or should we say whether this is original, good, um, valid, um, reliable, or should we focus on typographical errors? But then again, 
if we find that the wording of a sentence makes it illegible, illegible or not clear or having a different meaning, if there are errors in referencing and if the manuscript needs major editorial assistance, this is something that a peer reviewer should indicate. Uh, and also, uh, you as a reviewer can make uh, comments on ethics or integrity issues uh, to see whether all ethics issues that are arising from research are addressed, uh, like the research on humans, on animals, uh, undisclosed conflicts of interest, uh, failure to acknowledge evidence. Uh, if you find duplicate publications or plagiarism uh, or concerns about the integrity of data, and in such cases, the editor has to be contacted. And um, the very useful um, tool in, in this is uh, a flowchart uh, from uh, the COPE uh, uh, Committee on Publication Ethics, which uh, tells both the editor and actually the reviewer what to do in such cases. What is the process that happens in a journal once there is an allegation of possible uh, misconduct, misconduct in a, a published or reviewed paper? So, we have to be aware that uh, when we write reviews, that also has to be done with integrity, that reviews shouldn't be inadequate. We just cannot say, oh, this is a good research, or this is bad research, I wouldn't publish in this journal. Why are you even sending it out for peer review? This is not a proper uh, peer review. It shouldn't be inconsistent. You cannot say one thing and then contradict the same thing later on in a review. It shouldn't be biased and it should be unethical. And we have had examples of uh, misconduct in peer review from authors uh, um, evaluating or peer reviewing uh, uh, their own research by pretending and, and making uh, fake uh, peer reviews. You even have something that has been described by rational cheating, but it only has been modeled, although we know that it does exist, but it's very difficult to uh, test this in real life where actually if you're in in competitive area you can kind of downgrade and uh, uh, decrease your comments so that uh, the paper re rejected giving you time so that you can publish your own research in in that field field and of course the rude reviews are also not something that uh, we should uh, be proud of and uh, that uh, has integrity so finally, I, I want to conclude this part because we, we're going to have a discussion now that uh, COP also has a, a kind of a flowchart for reviewers when you receive an invitation from a journal for peer review, what to do, you know, starting with a, with a question that is very um, pertinent today, is this a fake journal? Is this a real journal? Should I invest my time as a reviewer for this journal? And then you can follow this flowchart to see what the expectations and responsibility of a peer reviewer are. And now, uh, instead of a last page and asking for a uh, um, uh, questions, I'm uh, what we, we thought is that before we um, um, uh, have uh, questions open that we play a little bit of, of a peer review uh, a game. This is a game where uh, that we started in uh, developed for the training period training school on peer review that we now teach at our summer school of responsible research where you can uh, see it at, at this link and, and this is a game where uh, we give different statements. It, it's a game that is a, really a card game and we exchange cards, but which cannot be done here. So what we're going to do is just to ask, uh, uh, give some statements and then we're going to ask what you think about them. Do you agree or don't agree with them? And then we can comment. These questions address responsiveness in peer review, they address competence, they address impartiality of peer review, confidentiality, constructive criticism and responsibility. Uh, so if I can ask uh, Julio to, I will stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint and then we can uh, have these statements and have then perhaps a, a discussion. So let me just uh, click on stop sharing. And here you have uh, one statement, so you can answer, choose uh, whether you agree or you don't agree with this statement. Do we have the results? Not yet, Anna. Okay. <laughs> because I'm really interested to, to see what, what you will say so that we can comment on that. We'll take a few seconds. 
Okay, no problem. Oh no, answers. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, uh, maybe you, you didn't leave it long enough. Perhaps. Maybe we can do it again. Just give me okay. a second. No problem. We definitely are looking forward to the answers. <laughs> it's not an answer. I don't think there is the, there is an answer to this, but it would be interesting to see what uh, we get. Giacomo, is the poll working or you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to reset it. It will take one minute. Mm -hmm. Or the mystery would. I'll uh, use this time just to answer to a question from. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I see uh, some polls. Uh, uh, I think that a recorded presentation will be available. Yeah. Um, uh, I, somebody said that I couldn't hear my voice, but I hope that other people are um, uh, doing. Okay, now we have a poll. Okay, the yeah. poll should be on the screen now. Yeah, it is. One thing was the results uh, are available. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, the University of Bicocca Milan, who has uh, kindly offered us the use of uh, their platform. Uh, Reviewer Credits is in fact a spin-off of the University of Bicocca, so we uh, work with them very closely in these uh, educational initiatives. <clears throat> Uh, are we still waiting? The poll doesn't look like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. anyway, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know what, what you said. I would be interested to see what you said. But uh, this is something that is really question. Oh, there you go. Oh, you agree. You. OK, you quite interesting that many people agree. Uh, of course, as an editor, maybe you are as, as a researcher, I may choose I agree. But as an editor, uh, it's also important, and, and for example, the COVID-19 pandemic is an example where you want the information to be out uh, as soon as possible and at the same time keep the uh, uh, the strength and the rigor of, of uh, the review and editorial process uh, high, just as we saw, you know, that sometimes can go uh, very wrong with the recent uh, retractions uh, of major papers in major journals on, on COVID-19. Uh, um, uh, time is also essential in uh, sharing the information. And I think this is something that has to be agreed up front. For example, some journals like The Lancet, they have this expedited um, uh, peer review process where they promise that peer review will take 10 days and then publication of full paper will take over randomized controlled trial or so the big study will take another 10 days. So there, there is a way where we can uh, publish uh, good research and still keep the rigor and integrity of uh, peer review, but this has to be agreed before peer review. So this is something I think that the peer review also has to be responsive to the requirements of different journals. Some journals take longer time, but some take a shorter time. And in some instances, sharing of information on time is very crucial. So that would be my position in this case. Right. Anna, Melanie points out that time required for peer review and reviewer availability. I don't have time to do this for another three weeks are different things. So absolutely, mm -hmm. it goes into the practical questions of peer mm -hmm. review and peer reviewer availability, I guess is a definitely. big issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it, it nowadays, it's very difficult to find a, a peer reviewer, because one of the things is uh, uh, the, the problem of predatory journals. Uh, you know, you are probably, in, uh, they have lots of uh, such invitations for peer review, for conferences. So it's very difficult to know whether this is a legitimate journal that is asking you to be a peer reviewer. So it has become very, very difficult, even for major journals, to find uh, peer reviewers. A couple of other questions which I collate. Sure. It's uh, 
should more manuscripts be triaged by editors without peer review? So less uh, burden definitely. on reviewers. Yeah, uh, this is something that has that is regular in uh, medicine. If you're a big medical journal like the Lancet, New England, JAMA, you may receive up to twenty thousand papers a year. And what they do, they have first uh, sorting and evaluating by editors and this is called a desk uh, rejection or editorial rejection where uh, manuscripts are rejected without sending out for peer review in these big journals only about 30 percent of uh, the submissions are sent out for peer review and there is actually research that shows that uh, an editor can make the same decision they, they did a randomized trial in, in the BMJ where the editors, when they evaluated this first tri triage of uh, uh, manuscripts, they evaluated only the abstract and the full paper, and they show that the decisions are the same. So there is no difference in the editorial opinion and decision on uh, editorial rejection when they read only a 350 word abstract or the full paper. So it saves time and then it saves uh, the peer review time so that the authors can then send it to another journal instead of waiting uh, for a long time uh, to, to go out for peer review that would result in rejection. So it's just impossible, physically impossible in some journals to send out everything for peer review. Another question is related more to if you have experience and what has been your experience on post-publication peer review. You know, what, what you feel it will be the role of this kind of peer review in the future? Um, I think this is uh, an exciting uh, experiment. Um, it's open peer review, as I said, is uh, quite common in medicine and, and we are used to that. It, uh, what, what is interesting with open peer review and post-publication is in a way of uh, open peer review, except in open peer review you learn everything about uh, the um, the peer review after it's published and only for accepted papers, whereas in platforms of uh, post-publication peer review, you can see um, uh, also papers that don't proceed from the initial stage, that they are not uh, um, kind of uh, evaluated as something that has to have a final uh, version. Uh, but I think it, it will be interesting to see more analysis on uh, uh, what is uh, what happens with the papers that are not good enough, how many of them are, uh, do they get published somewhere else? So uh, this is something that, that is uh, uh, developing. But what we know from evidence about uh, open peer review is that uh, it's not better than uh, single blind or double blind. Uh, and there were, again, randomized trials in the BMJ that looked at that uh, uh, aspect of open peer review, where their hypothesis was that open peer review will be better. So they found that it's not better that single blind peer review but uh, that uh, it's not worse and that they said for the sake of transparency, we uh, will go with the open uh, peer review and also the, the uh, reviewer comments were more polite. So people, when they know that the name will be under signed under a peer review, they are um, their language, they change the language uh, in the peer review to make it more uh, collegial and probably with more integrity, I would say. Right. Just talking about the reward for peer review, and obviously you touch upon that uh, just uh, quickly, but uh, we at uh, Reviewer Credits, we just did a, a survey among our community of peer reviewers to try to understand what was kind of uh, a driver for them to do uh, mm -hmm. peer review and what would they like to, and certainly their focus was on the availability of educational, um, uh, initiatives for them or some of the social initiatives uh, and uh, just the minority of them had been interested in a kind of monetary reward. So mm -hmm. what's your feeling uh, about that in general? Uh, I think that, uh, and I talk here as a researcher, I, I would say that uh, your reward as a peer reviewer is uh, your research reward. You know, as a researcher, you are recognized to have sufficient expertise that you can uh, review someone else's uh, work. On the other hand, also, uh, you see uh, new things. I think uh, we all get educated, we get new ideas when we review something. 
Um, and um, in some countries, for example, in medicine, we get uh, licensing credits for peer review. So you can get your credit uh, as, as a, a physician for your a license as a physician from peer review. It also gets counted for promotion, one of the aspects of your social contribution uh, in your academic uh, uh, advancement is uh, being a peer reviewer. And that's why we ask or get certificates that we have peer reviewed for different journals. And also, and if I would say from a general point uh, of uh, side of view, organizing payments of, I don't know, 100 euros or 50 euros or $100 to different people across the world is a very cumbersome process. Uh, it creates uh, tax problems for, for them. Uh, so it's really very difficult. And I know that the BMJ had an experiment where they said, okay, um, we are open access uh, publishers. We ask this from our reviewers and we're going to pay all our reviewers, but they had to discontinue it because it was just uh, w wasn't possible as kind of a business business model for, especially for a large journal with lots of reviewers. So I think that intellectual reward here is much more important. You know, I don't do it for 100 euros, but you do it for the excitement of, of research and uh, the value that you're giving back to the community. Right. Well, would we love to thank you for all uh, your comments. Uh, would we, let me see if there is uh, one uh, comment. I think I saw a comment uh, that asked about what would be the best peer review model for med medical research. Oh, please. And as I say, uh -huh. as I say um, a single blind peer review is um, quite common. There is lots of open peer review. Uh, and we also have to uh, know, that, and I speak from a position of a journal editor that is from a small scholarly journal. So it's different when a journal is a part of a big publisher and you have all the resources and uh, possibilities to make all kinds of innovation and technological advancement and uh, different um, experiments. But for a small journal in a small scientific community with not many funds, it, this is really a problem because already we have to have somebody who checks the registration of clinical trials, check conflicts of interest, uh, uh, all, all kinds of uh, checks and balances that we have to do, which uh, require plagiarism software, uh, digital image manipulation, uh, which is uh, in a way one of the questions was about reviewing pictures and images. And this is what, what we do with, in a way, the reviewing the integrity of uh, images that are to be published. This requires a lot of um, financial effort and uh, um, the personnel effort and it's very difficult uh, for small scholarly journals uh, to do that in comparison to bigger uh, publishers which have uh, like a central um, technology to, to support it. So um, if, if something is work, if something works, let's not change it. Uh, and I think experimenting is good. And uh, as they say, that uh, smart people learn from this mistake and uh, wise people learn from the mistakes of others. I'd rather wait to see how it develops when we have evidence and then you can implement it, uh, what works best, I would say. And I don't know if there are other uh, questions on your screen because obviously some are directed yeah. to you and some directly to you. So th there is one uh, question whether um, any platform to identify the misconduct from peer reviewer himself or herself is if recognized. Um, I don't know because as, as we said, it, it would be interesting to see whether there are some instances in uh, post-publication peer review platforms like F1000 uh, Research, but we don't see misconduct of peer review because this is a confidential process. It's a hidden process uh, most often. So we wouldn't know that although we know that there are uh, uh, like these fake peer reviews where uh, people created uh, different identities of different people and created their emails and then uh, the authors themselves reviewed their paper. There was a big scandal and uh, some of the publishers had to re retract uh, um, a number of uh, papers because of, because of that. And there are some suggestions of uh, electronic tools, how this can be prevented that uh, um, the, these emails are not misused. But uh, at the moment, uh, the only way that we can uh, uh, comment papers is, for example, on uh, 
uh, pub peer, like like an online journal club, where then some issues of peer review misconduct can emerge. I think we are approaching the hour, so mm -hmm. uh, we just have a comment from Heather uh, that would like to hear more about models for humanities and social sciences peer review. I think this is a, a yeah. all webinar possibly. I don't know if you uh, want to comment Yeah, I, I think that would be really a great time. Uh, that's one of the things that I'm interested in now. I'm collaborating on in peer review research with lots of um, uh, social scientists uh, like Professor Squazzoni, that uh, that was your uh, guest on one yeah. of the webinars. And and there is difference. And, and uh, I think it's difficult, you know, in, in medicine and in hard sciences, what we're lo actually looking is at data, you know, so we actually would need to see tables, figures and see uh, whether it fits. And in humanities and social sciences, it's, uh, it's a different uh, a topic it's so it's opinion so you know what i thought aristotle thought and what you think and we don't agree so it's more of a kind of a intellectual argument than actually checking hard data so i i'm definitely seeing that there are differences we know for example from research that peer reviews in social science and humanities are much longer than in uh, biomedicine. But there are some interesting things. For example, I, I've never thought that, uh, for example, digital image manipulation would be a very important topic for medieval frescoes journal, <laughs> that they have to check every image in their journal because it could be taken and, and uh, uh, manipulated from uh, the web and so on and so on. And I thought that, you know, we are talking about the same issues, you know, from a biomedical journal where we look at gel and, and uh, uh, fluorescent images of cells, and then we look at medieval frescoes. So I, I think there is a lot of uh, space and, and uh, areas where we can talk together about it and that, that, that they are really very similar, what, what we do. Well, I'm afraid, Anna, we have reached the hour. So first of all, let me thank you all the attendees. I hope uh, we have, you have enjoyed the, uh, this uh, very entertaining i would say <laughs> or an impactful presentation by anna thanks again thank anna, you for it was my pleasure and again thanks to university of bicocca for hosting this webinar and to the next webinar by review mm. credits uh, don't forget <laughs> to join our community yeah, bye, bye bye bye, bye, bye. goodbye everybody thanks bye -bye.